Welcome to The Reality Revolution. I'm your host, Brian Scott. Today, we're going to talk about healing hands. We have a new author we're introducing, Sidney Abram Weltmer, who was best known for the Weltmer Method, and he founded the Weltmer Institute of Suggestive Therapeutics, and he had claimed a technique that he referred to as magnetic healing. He wrote several books. There's a great book he wrote called Healing Hands, and I've been doing some interesting research on Weltmer, and a lot of the material is really well written and has specific techniques on how you can use your hands and suggestions to help people heal. He was before Lewis Hay was doing this, and some of it's very compelling and powerful, and I've even had the opportunity to experiment with this a little bit. Frederick Dotson is somebody who's written about healing hands and has suggested he's had visions of some other higher place in his most recent book on levels of heaven and hell. It discusses the idea that in some higher level of consciousness, people are simply healed through laying of hands. And we see this referred to in the Bible with Jesus. So can I heal someone with my hands? Is there a way to do it properly? Is it possible or is it a joke? So as I started researching this, I found the Weltmer method and learned a lot more. And then there's some stuff here you can experiment with if you want to heal someone else. I think with all healings, the thing to remember is you're not healing anybody. They're healing themselves. You're helping to activate that healing within themselves or utilizing the greater spiritual substance around us to do it. You are just a facilitator. You are the one that is facilitating the healing. You are not doing the healing. That's why I would never take money to heal someone. It feels like I'm using something else. But some people out there are really good healers. I'm not saying there's a problem with that. But this method will help us to understand healing and the laying of hands. If this is a part of the new earth, of the fourth density, as implied by Dodson, then why not start to understand this method of healing? He wrote a book called Healing Hands, one of several books. In fact, I believe he wrote about 20 books. Some of them are really good. And he talks about telepathy and thought transference. And I could definitely read this entire book. There is a section in the middle, which we, we may return to, that talks about thought transference and forgiveness and some other concepts around which his healings are based. But I'm going to give you the fundamental chapters from this book he has called Healing Hand, and it will help you to understand his process of healing. And we can use this as a foundation to start on as we establish more information about how to heal. Weltmer discussed healing through the process of suggestion, and he taught a threefold method, suggestion through hand, suggestion through spoken word and written word, and through telepathy. Understanding that foundation is a good start. He begins by saying, this is written with one big purpose of being helpful to everyone who reads it. Whether this reading is only for a few moments to merely glance at its pages or to read it consecutively chapter after chapter. It has in it, in every line of it, a statement of fact learned from everyday life. The purpose of the writer is to present the basic principles of the law of life and the lessons that life teaches. Reviewing the pages of everyday life, we know that we acquired all of our knowledge in response to those things of environment which made us think. Those influences that caused us to think right, that inspired us to learn more, to do more, and to exercise the intent of helpfulness in what we thought and did were most valuable, and that which has value to one person has value to all. It is a self-evident fact of experience that nothing comes to us that is molded into constructive thought or action, that does not come out of us in response to something that made us think. That's something which caused us to think, no matter in what form it was presented to us, is suggestion. The one who can help most of his fellow man 
is one who knows what suggestions were helpful to him when he made his response to them, and he will know what suggestions to give and in what manner to present them, that they will be more helpful to those he desires to serve. In this book is set out simply and clearly an idea of service which can understand. We define service as that influence which one exerts that helps another, or that one offers to another by which the person to whom it is offered is enabled to make his responses in such a manner that they enable him to help himself. There are three desirable impulses in each life seeking opportunity for expression. They are health, happiness, and prosperity. Health is first comprehended in our conscious life as a physical condition satisfactory to the individual. A close inspection will show that health is merely the expression of something and that something is life. That something existed before the flesh it occupies was organized into a body. Long before he even realized that he had a body, the real individual life in each person, unconscious of how he did it, helped to build this organization and established the laws and rules for their administration. The operation of these laws within the physical organism without change from the original order established carries on the life processes in a perfect manner. When this order is undisturbed in its activity, the body occupied is in a state of health. We know now that health is the perfect life stream flowing through the body which it shaped and occupies. Happiness is health in another form and is composed of the right things of life properly understood, rightly related and constructively expressed in thought which finds its outlet in doing things with this body, through this body and using this body to perform the activities which require contact with the physical world, also using its mental powers in dealing with the relationship that exists between the thought selves of other individuals and himself. Prosperity is the unhampered and uninterrupted outflow of right intentions through the healthy body and the sound mind of a man. Prosperity is the application of the laws of physical well-being, conscious right thinking, applied to the things which we know and express in such a manner that everything it touches is increased, everything it serves is helped, everything it speaks to is enlightened, and everything to which it turns its attention is enriched thereby. Prosperity is the expression of a man who is physically well and mentally sound, exercising that courage which makes him able to bestow the gifts which he has inherited as a spiritual being, that of power, of love, and of a sound mind. Exercising these gifts, he prospers and causes all upon whom he bestows his gifts to share in his prosperity. Believing that we have rendered a service to humanity, we offer this book, knowing that all who read its contents and understand its meaning will be immeasurably benefited. The human hand is trained from infancy to express the thought or purpose of the mind which controls it. The hand is the tool which the mind depends upon when it wants to get anything done. Thoughts of action naturally turn to the hand for their expression. The hand is the first means of expression. The baby uses the hand long before it learns to talk. The savage who has but a few words in his vocabulary depends upon the hand to express his thought. The hand ministers, it carries aid. The hand lifts the fallen ministers to the sick. It is peculiarly the organ of expression of the good wishes of the kindly disposed. When we are hurt, we instinctively place the hand upon the injured part. When another suffers and we sympathize, we instinctively use the hand to soothe his pain. Clasped hands are the universal pledge of friendship and goodwill. From the earliest dawn of civilization, the hand has been used in the most sacred ceremonials. The hand is the natural organ of expression, and its actions are mental symbols to which man has learned to make response through untold ages of experience and adaptation. The Hand and the Ancients 
The expression, the hand of God, is frequently used in the Bible and with a wide range of meaning. For instance, it is used to signify God's eternal purpose and executive power, Acts 4.28.30. His providential bounty and goodness, Psalms 104.28. His mighty power to preserve and defend, John 10.28-29. His sovereign power, Psalms 31.15. His help, Nehemiah 2.8. His favor, Luke 1.66. His spirit, Ezekiel 1.3.37.1. 1, his providence, 1 Chronicles 29.16. By the laying on of hands, priests were consecrated, ministers were ordained, and special gifts conferred on individuals at the command of God. Moses, by the laying on his hands, appointed Joshua his successor, Numbers 2718. The apostles, through the laying on of hands, conferred the Holy Ghost on those who had been baptized. Acts 817. If you will study the manner in which Jesus used his hands in healing and the directions which he gave his disciples for using them for the same purpose, you will probably get an enlarged idea of the importance and place which Jesus intended the laying on of hands should have among his followers. Jesus himself healed the sick by laying his hands upon them. He laid his hands on a few sick folk and healed them, Mark 6, 5. Now when the sun was setting, all that had any sick with divers disease brought them unto him, and he laid his hands on every one of them and healed them, Luke 4, 40. And he laid his hands on her, and immediately she was made straight and glorified God, Mark 13, 13. Apparently, the use of his hands was commonly regarded as a regular part of his procedure. For Jairus said to him, My little daughter lieth at the point of death. I pray thee come and lay thy hands on her, that she may be healed, and she shall live. Mark 5.23 After commanding his disciples to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, Jesus declared, These signs shall follow them that believe. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. Mark 16, 18. That these were not mere idle words from the mouth of Jesus is shown by the fact that it was through the laying on of hands of Ananias that Paul received his sight after he had been smitten with blindness while on his way to Damascus. And Paul also healed in the same matter. And it came to pass that the father of Publius lay sick of a fever and of a bloody flux, to whom Paul entered in and prayed and laid his hands on him and healed him. Acts 28.8 We have quoted only a few of the many passages in the Bible. Cruden's Concordance gives more than 500 such, in which the hand is used as an instrument in conveying some thought of blessing or in healing. But they are sufficient to show that both the prophets and Jesus understood the power of the hand and made an extensive and varied use of it. Jesus even made healing by the laying on of hands one of the tests of the genius of the belief in him, of those who profess to follow his teachings. Mark 16, 18. It is not strange, therefore, that the hand has played an important part in Christian literature, and in the symbolism and ceremonies of the church, but under the influence of the words, an example of the prophet and of Jesus, is it not strange that Christian people have not further developed this instinctive idea that the hand is the means for blessing and help? From the time of Edward the Confessor to the reign of Queen Anne, the English and French rulers touched and cured thousands of sufferers from scrofula. Although the hand as a means for expressing conscious thought is more important, it is far more important as a means for impressing an awakening response from the unconscious mind. It is the unconscious mind that must be aroused in all healing, for it is upon its actions that all healing depends. The unconscious mind or the healing mind, God's healing power in man, is the only healer of the ills of man. It is that force which has been called nature by physicians since the time of Hippocrates, who taught that nature is the first of the physicians, who, and who used the vis medicatrix naturae, the healing power of nature, as the foundation of his philosophy of medicine. Whether Hippocrates conceived of nature as an intelligent power or force within the individual, or whether he considered it a blind force acting under certain laws, we do not know. 
But we do know that some of the ancients considered nature as the hand or word of God, or even as God himself, in all things that exist. Spinoza, the God-intoxicated man, regarding nature as infinite intelligence, permeating all things, imminent in all things, the only power which could react to external stimuli. Modern thinkers teach that nature is subjective mind because it operates under intelligent laws, and that all actions of the objects of nature are intelligent actions. Mind is that power in nature, which can react through the things of environment, which makes natural relations orderly. Mind is the source of the universal harmony, which keeps the stars in their courses and makes the earth bloom with summer and sleep with winter, which makes a man a man and keeps him so through strife and turmoil, and heals his ills and binds up his broken heart when life has borne too hardly upon him. The mind acting is the mind thinking. The product of thinking is thought. The mind's action is the mind's thought. In other words, an action of the mind is a thought, and the process of mind acting is thinking. All thoughts, whether unconscious or conscious, are expressed, but many of them are expressed only in the organism of the thinker. The mind needs no words to command the hand. The intricate ramifications of the nervous system are the means which the mind uses for expressing such thoughts in different parts of the body. But there are no nerves to connect different beings with each other, so it becomes necessary to use some special means by which thoughts may be conveyed from one person to another. Such a means we call language and the organic process of using language for the conveyance of thought from one thinker to another is called speech. There are a great many forms of speech. The spoken word is not the only one. It is not even the one most used. It is merely that to which the term is most commonly applied because it is that form of expression that does nothing but speak and is the form of speech most closely related with words, which are the form used in recording language. There are many other forms of expression which are even more expressive than vocal speech. Gestural speech is a very important form of mental expression. The gestures, the expression of the face or of the eye, the manner, the tone of the voice, all of those unpremeditated, more or less unconscious expressions, which accompany the spoken word, are more potent in determining the impression created than the spoken words themselves. Gestures may be very effective alone, but the spoken word without gestures rarely has much force except in the written form, and even here no amount of skill in the use of words can quite make up for the loss sustained when the gestures of the speaker are lacking. Any means used for the expression of thought may be called language, and speech is any process that employs such a means. The use of the hand is therefore a form of speech, and in fact it is the most effective form of speech that we can use. The hand is the chief source of powerful gesture. The hand alone may be so expressive that no other form of expression is necessary, irrespective of the use of the hands in sign language of the deaf the hands are, of all organs of speech, the most important. The hand speaks to the conscious mind by means of appeals, which it makes through the senses, the soothing touch, the comforting pressure, the warmth it brings to the painful part, the manipulations of massage, the firm clasp, and all such actions constitute the language by which the hand conveys the thought of one person to the conscious mind of another. The language of the hand, which conveys thought to the unconscious mind, is, however, of quite another variety. It is a language of motion, but of quite another type of motion than those which we have noted above. The language of the hand, which conveys the healing thought of the therapist to the diseased tissue of the patient, is the hand's vibration, and that universally recognized but little understood vital emanation from the hand which we call manifluvium or vital magnetism. Motion is one of the primary facts of material nature. The super scientist of today would tell us that rates of motion and space relations which depend largely upon motion are at the foundation of matter itself. A great many of the phenomena of nature depend directly upon certain rates of motion. Certain rates of motion of ether give us light. Other rates the x-ray, the wireless telegraph, radiant heat, actinic light, and probably telepathy. 
Certain rates of motion of matter give sound. Other rates of different kind of motion give temperature, expansion, and determine the forms of matter, whether solid, liquid, or gas. The movements of masses are the most important factors in determining the conditions of the surface and forms of the earth. The falling rain, the power of the rushing stream, the erosive force of rocks and sands carried along by running water have made our soils worn away, shorelines smoothed down hills and have leveled mountains. The motion of the air has been little less important in shaping the surface of the earth. It makes the waves of the ocean, it shifts the sands, distributes the clouds and brings the rains or keeps them away. And finally, the infinite variety of the complex motions of which protoplasm is capable affords the basis of the phenomena of life. The chief difference between a living and a dead thing is that the live thing can move in a great many ways while the dead thing cannot. The live thing can make these motions of its own power while the dead thing has to be moved by external forces under the direction of external intelligence. Not only is inherent power of motion the sign of life, but its range is the measure of it. That thing has the highest form of life, which has the widest range of motion and the greatest capacity for adapting that motion to the end of perpetuating the self-moving power. Without motion, the world and even man as we know him would cease to exist. Motion, I repeat, is the principal fact in the universe. Therefore, it behooves us to study motion in itself apart from its special forms. There are three characteristics of all motions. Every motion is a movement of one, something, two, in some direction, and three, at some rate. Of these three characters, we are most interested for the time in the third. It is the rate of motion of matter that determines the audibility and then the pitch of the sound. It is the rate of the motion of ether which determines whether we shall see light and what color or feel heat or be sunburned or be affected by the x-ray. It is the rate of the motion of water which determines its carrying power, the rate of motion of the bullet which determines the force of its blow. And it is the rate of the protoplasmic motion of the living being which determines its capability of carrying on the functions of life. When protoplasmic movements are at the proper rate, the being enjoys smooth interchange of motion between its different parts and between itself and its environment, and we call that state of existence health. But when these rates of motion are disturbed, we call the resulting condition disease. It must be our concern to find means to restore to the sick man the power of keeping the proper rate of protoplasmic motion in his body for smooth operation. Whatever will do this will restore his health. But we must not fall into the error of thinking that this motion must be restored to the body directly, as we would raise or lower the number of vibrations of a string in order to get the pitch desired. Remember that the living thing has power to determine its own protoplasmic motions. That power is indeed the seed of its life. It is the possession of that power that makes it alive. That power also gives it self-motion. Any object that does not possess this self-moving power is dead and moves only as external force is applied to it. We do not know what rates of motion, what varieties, nor what combinations of motion are required for any living thing to make its condition that of smooth operation which we indicate by the term health. As conscious beings, we do not know the rate of the health motions of either ourselves or any other being, but we do know unconsciously what health motions are required for our own organisms, and each other living thing unconsciously knows for itself what motion is required to make it manifest health. Furthermore, it knows how to make its organism move at that rate and in that combination of varieties. Therefore, our task is to find the means of inducing that part of us which knows to produce the organism those motions which are required for its perfectly smooth, normal operation. Of all our agencies for doing this, the human hand is the most important. The hand of the therapist has in its own tissues in health, and at all times when expressing the therapist's strong intention to bring healing, those rates of movement which are normal to the body. 
These motions are of unknown forms and rates, but we may be certain that they are very fine and complex. They no doubt belong to those forms of motion generally known as vibrations, and hereafter we shall speak of them as the vibrations of the hand. By vibrations, however, we mean no discernible quiver or other trembling movement of the hand, but those invisible health vibrations in its tissues which are communicated to the tissues of the patient and so cause his unconscious mind to bring all the tissues of his body to similar vibrations. We have good illustrations of these relations in the study of sound. Every high school boy knows that when you vibrate one tuning fork of a certain pitch near to another exactly the same pitch, the second fork will be set into vibration by the first. This is called sympathetic vibration, and the second fork is said to vibrate in sympathy with the first. Sympathetic vibration occurs throughout nature. You may have noticed when you are singing from music that when you sing certain notes the book or sheet of music in your hand will vibrate. The back of your chair often vibrates to certain tones when you sit listening to lectures. It is said that a fiddler once frightened the guardians of the suspension bridge at Niagara Falls into letting him pass free by sawing on one note on his violin until he made the bridge quiver ominously. Every material object, if set into vibration, will emit some certain note, and it will sympathetically respond to the same note when produced outside of itself. When we talk of the health vibrations of the therapist's hand, we are not talking about sound vibrations. These health vibrations are probably much finer and far more complex than any sound vibrations. But we find in sympathetic sound vibrations a good illustration of what occurs when the therapist's hand is placed upon the painful and diseased tissues and restores them to health and ease. The normal vibrations of the hand are communicated to the patient's tissues where the hand touches them. These tissues are thereby caused to vibrate at that rate and in that manner which means health, just as the tuning fork responds sympathetically to another of its own pitch by recourse to other phenomena of sound we propose to illustrate our second proposition that when the unconscious mind of the patient finds that part under the hand vibrating at the normal life rate the health rate it will be induced to bring the rest of the organism into the same rate of vibration this we can illustrate by reference to the actions of the vocal and articulatory apparatus in singing and talking the pitch of the voice in speaking and singing is determined by the vocal cords, while articulation and tone quality depend mainly upon the resonance chambers of the head and face, especially those in the mouth and nose controlled by the tongue. The voice box, the larynx, is made up of cartilages, membranes, and muscles supplied with nerves which control them. In addition to the larynx and its special vocal structures, the whole respiratory apparatus is brought into such close relation to the special speech organs that the vibrating cords are supplied with any desired volume of air for setting them into motion and for carrying their vibrations outward through the mouth and nose where the organs of articulation determine the tone quality. If you have never done so, feel the small of your back or your abdominal wall or the chest wall or the muscles of the neck when you sing or speak in a strong voice you no doubt will be surprised to discover that muscles in all of these regions are brought into strong action in the process. And not only are these muscles brought into action in the production of the voice, but that action is controlled and coordinated action. All of these widely separated parts are carefully regulated with reference to each other and to the desired result. The center of all this activity is the vocal cords. These are the organs which fundamentally produce the tone. Scientific study of sound has shown that for each tone produced, there is required a certain rate of vibration which will produce that pitch and no other. Men talked and sang for a long time before this was known to science, and even now that it is known, very few speakers or singers concern themselves about it when they learn to use the voice. No amount of conscious knowledge of pitches and combination of pitches will enable the singer consciously to control the vocal cords so as to produce any certain tones. This is all done unconsciously, 
all that happens in the conscious mind is that the singer forms a clear idea of the tone desired and then trusts the unconsciously controlled mechanism of the voice to produce it. It may be necessary consciously to train some of the respiratory apparatus in order to bring under better control the volume and to supply always the required amount of air. And it may be necessary to correct certain bad conscious habits, but when it comes to the matter of making the vocal cords take that tension that will produce just the exact number of vibrations per second required for the desired tone, the conscious mind is powerless. The unconscious mind attends to that. Take, for instance, the note middle A. This tone is produced by 435 vibrations per second. No other rate of vibration will produce it, and only a certain tension of any set of vocal cords can make the number of vibrations per second. From time to time, as the length and thickness of the vocal cords change with growth or the condition of health, the necessary tension changes. The conscious mind knows nothing of these conditions, but the unconscious mind keeps perfectly informed of them and makes the necessary adaptations. When a speaker desires to speak or sing at the pitch of A and with a certain force, the unconscious mind, which is in control of the vocal apparatus, brings the vocal cords under a certain tension, puts the air in the lungs under a certain pressure, and shapes the tongue in certain forms, with the result that the desired tone is produced. If it is desired to sing a higher or lower tone, the vocal cords are made to vibrate accordingly. One has only to desire to make any note within the range of the vocal powers, and the unconscious mind, through the apparatus at its disposal, will set the vocal cords to vibrating at the necessary rate. Whether the conscious mind knows anything at all about the process or not, now that same unconscious mind, that knows how and is able to control all of the intricate mechanisms which produce the voice, knows how and is able to control the vibrations of the hand and of the rest of the body. The therapist who is trained to do this can desire that his hand shall vibrate at the health rate and the unconscious mind will make it do so. When this vibration is communicated to the tissues of the patient, his unconscious mind will be given a suggestion which carried into effect will cause the patient's unconscious mind to bring all of the tissues of his body into vibration at the health rate. It is no more difficult to make the tissue vibrate at the rate necessary for health than it is to make the vocal cords vibrate at the rate to produce some certain tone. This is one of the things that the unconscious mind naturally knows how to do. This is one of the things that has been done throughout the life of the patient, something that it has inherited the knowledge of how to do. If we can but remove the influences that have interfered with its doing this, and if we can give a strong impulse, suggestion to do it, there is no reason why it should not bring the tissues into a perfect harmony of vibration at the rate that means perfect health. That the hand can be used to speak the suggestion that will bring about this result has been proven in innumerable cases where this was the principal or the only treatment used. One of the difficult problems offered to medical science is to administer a remedy that will restore a normal condition of the capillary circulation without destroying the life of the patient. This can be done within a very few minutes by the suggestionist who knows how to convey his suggestion through the vibrations of the hand. A Mr. S. from Indianapolis came under our care about two years ago. His physical condition presented a case of pernicious anemia with a temperature of two degrees below normal, skin showing no surface circulation, cold and contracted, and breathing difficult, accompanied by extreme weakness. The suggestion necessary in this case should call upon his subjective mind to restore a normal capillary circulation. This suggestion was delegated to the hand. Its active principle was the intention to arouse the subjective mind into harmonious action with the purpose stated. The hand was applied to the patient's body, allowed to remain for a period not to exceed 20 minutes, at the end of which time perfect capillary circulation resulted and a normal temperature was in evidence. This was repeated in 24 hours. On appearing for the second application, the patient had retained more than one half of the temperature induced by the first treatment. At the end of a series of about 12 applications, a normal circulation normal appetite, and increasing strength was so much in evidence 
that the patient was dismissed, returned to his duties, and continued to improve until perfect health was the result. There has been no relapse, but a condition of steady improvement has obtained, showing that the subjective mind reinstated in control of the physical functions has maintained its ascendancy. Although this patient is not conscious of the operation of his own mind, which assisted the suggestion of the healer in restoring him to health. The above is one of many hundreds of cases varying in degree which have responded in the same manner to suggestion, where its transmission has been conveyed to the patient's body without in any explanation given to the patient objectively as to the process of his recovery. It would be easy to recall four or five hundred cases that have come under our immediate notice some showing an instantaneous result, others requiring from a week to four weeks of daily repetition of the same suggestion before a complete cure was made. In another case, a man suffered so severely from frequent attacks of sciatica, which sometimes lasted a week or more, that he was unfitted for the work he was doing, that of chief of the fire department of our city. In his case, the hands were placed on his body with the intention they would convey to his inner mind the suggestion to relax perfectly and that his nerves would be restored to perfect health. In this case, the response was immediate and the trouble has not recurred during a period of 20 years. In a case of chronic diarrhea, continuing from the time of the Civil War until the spring of 1897, the hand was applied at the suggestion for a period of not to exceed five minutes during which the unconscious healing mind of this old confederate soldier restored normal action with permanent results. We have dealt with the hand as a source of suggestion to the conscious mind through gesture, as a source of suggestion to the unconscious mind through the health vibrations which it transmits to the tissues with which it has contact. It yet remains for us to study the hand as the source of an emanation which passes from the therapist to the patient. This emanation has been known from the earliest times, and yet even today we understand very little of its nature or properties. Each new observer in each age has called it by a different name, according to his idea of its nature or properties. Among the many names by which it has been designated are Magneb Magnum by Van Helmont, Odic Force by Reichenbach, Animal Magnetism by Mesmer, Vital Magnetism and Human Electricity by others. It was used in earlier times by names unknown to us, the transmission of this emanation probably being the object of the first manipulations which later were developed into the technique of massage. A classic example of the transmissions of this emanation is found in the fourth chapter of Second Kings, which recounts the story of Elisha's restoring life to the son of Shunanamite. Frequent references are to be found in ancient literature to the practice of employing vigorous, healthy persons for giving strength to very weak or very old persons. The hand is used for the purpose of communicating this emanation in all countries through some form of healing rite. There can be no doubt that this is one of the sources of the healing power of the hand. All of the names which have been given to this emanation from the body are objectionable because they rest upon some theory of its nature. We do not know enough about the nature of this emanation to name it from that point of view. We know much more about what it is not than about what it is. We know that it is not electricity, nor magnetism, in any exact meaning of these terms. We do know, however, that it flows from the hands into the bodies of others, where it causes many to experience a gentle tingling sensation that it is visible to most people under certain circumstances, that it will make water glow faintly in the dark, that it will change the taste of water, that in water and other carriers it will convey the intention of the therapist to the patient without the patient's knowledge of what that intention was, and that at least a considerable part of the credit for manual healing seems properly to belong to the beneficent power of this emanation. In the absence of more definite information as to the nature of this emanation, it has seemed undesirable to name it according to some idea of what it is. Hence my son, Dr. Ernest Weltmer, has made yet another name for it. He has called it manifluvium, a term literally meaning a flow from the hand. This name describes its source only and says nothing about its nature. While the term is a good one, I still find it somewhat cumbersome 
and we have grown accustomed to using one of the older terms, vital magnetism, that I frequently use the older term even now though. It is not really as good as the new one. In general, I use the two terms interchangeably. I shall do so in this book. Experiments by means of which manifluvium or vital magnetism is made visible as it flows from the hand show that some persons produce more of it than others, and that the amount of the emanation varies with the same person at different times. Those who are most successful and who had the most practice in the use of the hands in the treatment of the sick show the greatest flow, and when a person makes an effort to produce a greater flow, and when he thinks of the hand as he uses it in healing, the flow is increased in proportion to the intensity of the mental state. While we would like not to make a rule even from the many observations which we have made in this manner, we feel that it is entirely probable that the great therapists of all times have had a great flow of this vital magnetism from their hands. It is very probable that this is the source of the idea that the hand conveys a healing power from the therapist to the patient. It is probable that this is what the woman received when she touched the hem of Jesus' robe and he knew that virtue had gone out of him. Mark 5.30 Many a person who has expecting nothing of the kind has felt he was giving some force to another when he has placed his hand upon someone who was suffering or hurt. And many a sufferer has felt that he was receiving some power from the therapist, even though neither had any idea that such a force was being communicated from one to the other. These many separate but convergent lines of evidence point strongly to the reality and importance of manifluvium or vital magnetism as a source of healing in the therapeutic use of the hand. Whenever I place my hands upon the body of a patient, it is always with the intention not only that my hands shall take up the normal health vibration and transmit it to the tissues of the patient, but also that they shall transmit to his body a strong current of manifluvium, which is to work out in his body my intention for his perfect healing. On the whole, we may consider that vital magnetism or manifluvium is an important source of the healing power of the hand, independent of the suggestions of the therapist and expectations of the patient. Its production is under the control of the therapist and effect that it will have upon the patient depends upon the therapist's intention. It is without a doubt one of the important agencies used in manual healing, one of the sources of the therapeutic power of the healing hand. Laying on of hands. If the reader has been careful in his perusal of this work, he will have discovered that it is the great law of being that is the efficient cause in any act of healing. This law of being in exercising its power exercises its power through the unconscious faculties of the mind. In other words, the unconscious mind is the agent through which the law of being manifests itself. He will have seen that the unconscious mind controls the functions and activities of the physical organism that it controls the circulation of the blood, that it controls every gland in the body, controls every secretion, controls every muscle and nerve, controls every organ, that it is the great engineer and machinist that keeps the physical organism in activity and in repair. The reader will have seen that this unconscious mind is controlled by the law of suggestion and that by intention, suggestion, and the perfect memory, the unconscious mind is brought from wrong thought activity to right thought activity, which restores ease. The question will undoubtedly have risen in the minds of the reader. If it is the unconscious mind that heals the diseased organism, what is the use in laying on of hands? Is it not a superfluous act? This is a legitimate question and one we will briefly consider. The phenomena of dreams gives us a clue to the reasons for the laying on of hands. When we are locked in the embrace of sleep, the conscious mind is in perfect abeyance. The unconscious mind never slumbers, never sleeps, but is in constant activity. Physical sensations that come at the time when the conscious mind is in abeyance are known by the unconscious mind as sensations only. It cannot interpret the sensation, and not being able to interpret the sensation accurately, it gives its own interpretation, and that interpretation may be a right interpretation or a wrong one. The unconscious mind may be likened to a timid woman, shut up in a lonely house and alone at night. She hears a strange, weird noise on the outside. She cannot see what it is, 
that is making these strange noises and she gives her own interpretation to them. She conjures up in her mind burglars or wild beasts and immediately her physical organism is tense with fear. When the fact was, it may only have been the wind moaning through the shutters or some harmless dog or cat disporting itself upon the outside. But when the timid one had interpreted the sensation that came to her or him, it was as real to them as their belief. The unconscious mind represents that timid person. When the conscious mind is in abeyance, it is cognizant of all physical sensations but cannot interpret them aright, and it gives its own interpretation, like the timid woman, and in fear and in fright the physical organism is tensed. Who has not been awakened from a dream in which the physical organism had been interpreting physical sensations wrongly? While fear paralyzed, and muscles and nerves all were tense, and the perspiration was standing upon the brow. If the unconscious mind has the power of knowing physical sensations and has the power of misinterpreting them, when we remember the law of suggestion, we will see that the unconscious mind can be made to interpret the physical sensation in any way the suggestion directs. Remember that the physical sensation remains the same. It is only the interpretation that is changed, and the change of the interpretation of the sensation causes the physical effect. Here then lies the reason for the laying on of hands. To illustrate, here on a stool before me sits a patient. He is afflicted with stomach trouble. Sit down on his left side so that your right hand may be placed upon the spinal column and your left in front over the stomach. Stimulate the dorsal plexus with the right hand. Stimulate the nerves that control the stomach, thus starting up the perfect memory. Now, heat your hands by rubbing them together briskly. Lay your right hand on the spinal column, back of the stomach, and your left hand in front of the stomach and produce a physical sensation which the patient cannot deny. Ask him if he feels that physical sensation and he will reply yes. Then say to him, that will start healthy vibrations in the nerves and control the stomach and establish a healthy condition there. This last statement is a suggestion. A suggestion goes with the physical sensation to the unconscious mind. The unconscious mind interprets that physical sensation according to your suggestion and healthy vibrations will be established in the nerves that control the stomach and health activity will be reestablished there. You will see, then, that the laying on of hands is one of the means by which a suggestion is conveyed to the unconscious mind. Again, your patient comes to you with a headache. Seat him in a chair. Tell him to relax the muscles and assume an attitude of repose. Then gently stroke the forehead. Lay your right hand on the forehead, left hand on the cervical plexus at the base of the brain. Impart a gentle, quivering motion of the right hand by contracting the muscles of the biceps. That imparted motion from your hand is a physical sensation the patient cannot deny. Then say to him, these vibrations will establish right vibrations in the brain cells, equalize circulation of blood there, and the pain will disappear. The imparted motion of vibration of your hand is a physical sensation, and the last statement is the suggestion which going into the unconscious mind as an interpretation of the physical sensation finds lodgment there and becomes real to the unconscious mind and the headache disappears before giving any treatment it is well to explain to your patient the necessity of assuming a passive attitude in order that the conscious mind may be withdrawn from the disease or pain instruct the patient to call up to his mind a mental image of some scene or the face of some dear friend not formulating thought about either, but simply looking at it. Then you must assume the positive attitude of mind, thinking the thought you wish the patient to express, the thought of ease. Soon you will see that the patient under your thought will become more and more passive and thoroughly relaxed. And it is in that relaxed condition that the unconscious mind is left untrammeled to do its work, to knit up the raveled sleeve of care. You will see, therefore, that the laying on of hands assists the suggestion in finding lodgment in the unconscious mind. It might be said to be the mask behind which the suggestion enters, unsuspected, the unconscious mind.
The conscious mind cannot deny the physical sensation, and a suggestion going hand in hand with the physical sensation will not be challenged by the conscious mind. So physical sensation and suggestion going hand in hand find lodgment in the unconscious mind and accomplish the purpose whereunto they are sent. There is also another point. You will remember that among the faculties of the unconscious mind was that of the perfect memory. We can, by going back in our lives to childhood days or to manhood's or womanhood's prime, remember when every nerve thrilled with life, every muscle throbbed with strength, and life was one long holiday of pleasure. But a change came over the spirit of our dreams. Pain took the place of pleasure, weakness the place of strength, disease the place of ease. Remember that in that perfect memory every thought lies buried. Remember the intimate relationship that exists between the thought and the nervous condition attendant upon such thought. When in treating a patient we stroke the spinal column or any great nerve center and arouse those latent nerves to renewed activity. They in turn react upon the brain, creating the same vibrations that went forth in the day of health and strength. The perfect memory is aroused. These other conditions are recalled. The mind had thought that its function through these nerves was lost forever, but now it is reminded that they exist again. And then, because of that perfect memory, the mind again takes hold of the nerves that are dormant, apathetic, or nearly dead, and commences new activities as of yore. More than we know, perhaps, even more than we think, does this perfect memory operate as a factor in the healing of disease. Bear this in mind, that in all cases, it is the law of being whose agent is the unconscious mind that does the act of healing. That intention, suggestion, and the laying on of hands are but the means by which this agent is again started into activity to do its perfect work. Remember that when a patient is suffering from pain, he cannot think the thought of ease in that particular locality. The healer can think the thought of ease, and if the patient's mind will be passive and receptive to the positive mind of the healer, the vibrations from the healer's mind will act upon the brain cells of the patient's mind and establish the healing vibrations there which he could not establish for himself. And so we have the agreement of two minds by intention. Remember that in suggestion we have only the formulated statement of that upon which the minds agree and that in the laying on of hands we have the means by which the suggestion becomes responsive or is responded to in the unconscious mind of the patient. Thus intention, suggestion, and the laying on of hands are the means to secure the perfect agreement which is the keystone of the arch of the system of healing. By the treatment of a patient is meant the application of intention, suggestion, and the laying on of hands in such a manner as to change the wrong thought activity of the patient to right thought activity, to so operate upon the unconscious mind of the patient that unconscious mind will be led to discharge its high prerogative of caring for the body and keeping it in repair in the proper manner. In order that intention, suggestion, and the laying on of hands may bring about the desired result, a few other expedients seem to be necessary. The reader will remember that the laying on of hands was but the physical sensation behind which the suggestion entered the unconscious mind, undoubted and unchallenged. In order that the physical sensation may be most effective, it seems to be necessary to heat the hands before laying them on. Try this experiment. Raise the arms so that they will be at right angles to the body, projecting sideways. Then from the wrist let the hands hang limp and loose. Tense all the muscles of the arm for a second or two, as hard as you possibly can tense them. Then drop the hands by the sides and you will feel a sensation of fullness in the hands, the blood rushing down into them. If you will breathe upon the palms of the hands so as to impart a slight moisture, then rub the hands together briskly, you will be surprised at the amount of heat that will be developed in them. This process is called the heating of hands. By a little practice, it will not be necessary to raise the arms and tense the muscles, but the hands can be heated by friction as I have stated above. This, the reader will see, makes the physical sensation more noticeable to the patient. 
centers his attention upon the physical sensation more closely and enables the suggestion to reach the unconscious mind without being doubted, denied, or challenged. Another thing the heated hands will do is to center the attention of the patient on that spot. And then when the suggestion is given, the suggestion is responded to more readily by the unconscious mind as it is then engrossed in its attention upon the diseased part. Another aid to sending the suggestion to the unconscious mind is what is called imparted motion. Lay the right hand upon the plexus, which controls the organ you wish to treat. Then contract the biceps and impart a gentle, tremulous motion of the hand. Ask the patient if he feels it. Of course, he will reply, yes. His attention is then centered upon the motion. The unconscious mind has its attention centered upon the same place. Then, while the attention of both the conscious and unconscious minds is thus centered, the suggestion that these vibrations will restore healthy activity in the diseased organs will find lodgment in the unconscious mind and do its work. The reader will see that the laying on of hands, as I have said, is but the means to transmit the suggestion into the unconscious mind of the patient. He will see that the heated hands and imparted motion are only adjuncts to the laying on of hands, intensifying the physical sensation and attracting more fully the attention of both the conscious and unconscious minds to particular laps when the heated hands or imparted motion is applied. For convenience, we divide the treatment into two classes, general treatment and specific treatment. In general treatment, we aim to affect the whole physical organism. In specific treatment, we aim to affect a change only in some part or organ or function. In giving the general treatment, let the patient sit upon a stool or recline upon a padded table and then begin at the cervical plexus. Stroke the spinal column on either side down the entire trunk to the extremity of the body. Emerging from the vertebra of the spinal column from the cervical plexus to the extremity of the trunk are 31 pairs of nerves ramifying over the body in all directions, controlling the organs and the secretions of the body. By thus stroking the spinal column, these 31 pairs of nerves are started into activity. New life is imparted to them. The perfect memory of the patient is started up, and it begins to reflect upon the ease of other days. The nerves that the conscious mind thought were helpless the unconscious mind discovers to be only inactive, and often, instantaneously, the cure is affected by the action of the perfect memory. From the cervical plexus, all diseases incident to the head are treated. From the brachial and upper dorsal plexuses, we treat the throat, arms, lungs, and heart. From the dorsal plexus, all diseases of the stomach, bowels, and spleen are treated. From the sacral plexus are treated all diseases of the pelvic organs. The reader must remember that the success of any treatment, general or specific, depends upon the influence exerted upon the unconscious mind through intention, suggestion, and the laying on of hands. Suggestions and intentions will be effective just in proportion to the passivity of the patient and in proportion to the positive attitude which the healer assumes toward his patient. The first thing then, before giving any treatment, general or specific, is to place the patient in the passive attitude. If the treatment were to last 20 or 30 minutes, it would be better to spend one half the time in placing the patient in a passive attitude and the other half in giving the treatment by intention, suggestion, and the laying on of hands. The passive condition, as has been described in the previous chapter, is not the hypnotic condition. In the passive condition, the conscious mind is simply quiescent. The patient is not resisting. In the hypnotic condition, there is a change in the relation of the conscious mind of the patient to the external world. Experience in hundreds of cases has shown that in the hypnotic condition, a suggestion oftentimes takes effect far more rapidly than in the passive conditions, yet not more effectively. From inductions made in a vast number of cases, it appears that the cures affected through suggestion in the passive condition are far more permanent than the cures affected through the hypnotic condition. In a perfect hypnotic condition, the conscious mind of the patient is in entire abeyance, and upon awakening or coming out of the trance, there is no recollection in the conscious mind of what took place. 
The conscious mind immediately begins to doubt and to exercise the same thought activity that it exercised before, bringing placed in a hypnotic condition. While in the passive condition, both the conscious and unconscious minds are active in receiving the suggestions, and the conscious mind having been present when the agreement was entered into through suggestion and not having denied or challenged the agreement will not, upon coming out of the passive condition, doubt, deny, or challenge in the same degree that it doubted, denied, or challenged when there was no recollection of any agreement. While a cure brought about in the passive attitude may not be so rapid in developing, it will be more permanent. In concluding this chapter on treatment, the writer wishes to urge upon the reader the importance of a thorough comprehension of the principles involved so that there may be in his own mind no doubt of the results he seeks to attain when the conditions have been complied with. Doubt in the mind of the healer is as bad as doubt in the mind of the patient. In fact, it is worse. You will remember in the chapter on telepathy that the unconscious mind has the power of communicating with other unconscious minds by a law known only to itself. When the healer approaches the patient with unbounded confidence, the unconscious mind of the patient interprets that confidence and is affected by it. This may be seen in nearly every walk of life. Take a victorious horse, let a man approach him with confidence and strong willpower, and that horse will be obedient to him. But let a timid, doubting person approach him, and the horse will triumph over him. This is nothing more or less than the same principle in operation of which I have spoken. Although the conscious mind of the patient may be unaware of any doubt or lack of confidence or hesitancy on the part of the healer, the unconscious mind knows it and acts upon it. This confidence can only be attained through a knowledge of principles. If there is an incomplete knowledge, confidence will be incomplete just in proportion to that lack. Seek then to familiarize yourself with every principle involved and the law of its operation until it becomes second nature to you so that you know, not believe. Now, bring together all the elements that are necessary to constitute a successful healer. There is first the mind trained by concentration, to think one thought to the exclusion of every other thought, to withdraw his mind from the things of sense and center them upon the things of the spirit. This is necessary in order that he may exercise intention and that intention may do its perfect work. In this power of concentration lies his ability to place his patient in the passive attitude of mind. This he does by instructing his patient to relax bodily and mental tension and becomes receptive to himself. Then think the thought for him until he becomes passive. Then by laying on of hands and suggestion, an approach is made to the unconscious mind and the perfect memory with the unconscious mind acts upon the suggestion given and heals its own diseased body. The reader will have perceived in the reading of the previous chapters that the brain is in the mind's laboratory, and the only thing the mind can produce in that laboratory is thought. He will have seen that thought is a substance in motion, and that motion is called a vibration. He will have seen that thought waves go out from the mind as electric waves go out from the transmitting instrument in telegraphy. He will have seen that every thought causes a vibration in the brain cells, and this vibration is communicated to the sympathetic nervous system, which is but the brain extended, and that through the sympathetic nervous system, these thought vibrations are registered upon the physical organism, either in coarse, disintegrating vibrations or in gentle, regenerating vibrations. He will have seen that disease has its origin in wrong thought activity, that if ease is to take place, right thought activity must take the place of wrong thought activity. The reader will have seen that when wrong thought activity has been registered upon the physical organism, the sufferer is in bondage to this thought. The healer thinks the right thought for him, and he being passive to his healer receives unconsciously to himself the vibrations of right thought activity upon his brain cells, and they in turn are reflected upon his physical organism. The object of all this was to bring the thought of the sufferer into harmony with the vibrations of the law and being. The question now arises, is there any way that the patient can himself come into harmony with the law of being and thus have a change wrought in his physical organism? The answer is yes, 
although such a change from the very nature of things must be slower than the change which takes place when the patient and healer are working together. Remember that the necessary condition precedent to an act of healing is the law of agreement. In the law of agreement, the patient, by his passive attitude, abandons for the time his inharmonious thought activity and the harmonious thought activity of the healer takes its place, and thus both are in harmony with the divine thought activity, the law of being. If the patient desires to come into harmony with divine thought activity, the law of being, he must make himself passive or responsive to that law. This can be done in the following manner. First, let us notice the relationship that exists between the nervous and muscular tension and thought activity. When the conscious mind is actively engaged, the nervous system and consequently the muscular system is tensed, drawn up, contracted, and thus the gentle vibrations in which we live and move and have our being are impeded or hindered in their regenerating work. Hence it is by the law of our nature we are forced to sink down into slumber every 24 hours. The conscious mind being in perfect abeyance in sleep, the thought activity of the conscious mind ceasing the nervous and muscular systems are thoroughly relaxed, and the health-giving vibrations in which we live have free course to sweep through our physical organism, repair the waste, and knit up the raveled sleeve of care. Let me give a crude illustration, hence I am in a room into which it is necessary that fresh air shall be freely admitted for the preservation of my health. At the window openings in the screens we find meshes to admit the requisite amount of life-giving air. If my thought activity had the power to close those meshes by wrong thought activity and to open them wide by right thought activity, we would then see how it is that wrong thought activity shuts out the life-giving vibrations and the relaxed muscular and nervous systems admit these same vibrations freely. The window openings with the meshes closed represent the muscular and nervous systems tensed. The window openings with the meshes open wide represent the nervous and muscular systems relaxed. Relaxation is of prime importance, as the law of our nature shows, when by that law we are forced to relax into slumber in order that the life-giving vibrations may repair the waste of the day that has gone before. The first act of self-treatment the reader will see is perfect relaxation of the physical organism by relaxing the nervous and muscular systems. This condition is of greater importance than we are aware, and the writer cannot too strongly impress it upon the mind of the sufferer who would seek healing by himself, that he would come into harmony with the law of being. Another condition necessary to self-treatment is perfect relaxation of mental powers. In our minds there must be no tension that would keep out the healing vibrations in which we live and move and have our being. We must dismiss from our mind every thought of anger or jealousy or malice or contention or strife which we have against any brother in the world. Because although we may voluntarily strive to relax our nervous or muscular system, so long as a single wrong thought is held in the mind, that bodily relaxation cannot be perfect. This has been more thoroughly discussed in the chapter on forgiveness, which the reader is advised to consider hand in hand. Then when every thought of care, worry, anxiety, or perplexity has been dismissed from the mind, the health-giving vibrations can go in and impress themselves upon the brain cells. These are transmitted to the physical organism and healthy vibrations established therein. In the chapter on forgiveness, you have learned that whatever thought we entertain opens up brain cells to the reception of the same thoughts that lie floating around us. We open our minds to thoughts of hatred, envy, or malice. Every thought of hatred, envy, or malice that is floating in the universe of vibration round about us can enter into our brain cells and in turn be reflected upon our physical organisms, verifying in a scientific way that whatsoever a man soweth that shall he also reap. While if his mind sent out the thoughts of kindness, gentleness, sympathy, and brotherly love for all mankind, all like thoughts that are floating in this universe of vibrations in which we live and move have our being can come in and establish the same vibrations and in turn be reflected upon the physical organism, giving health and strength, establishing pleasure in the place of pain, ease in the place of disease, in the chapter on consciousness, the reader saw that in consciousness we come to a knowledge of the forms of being 
and realize our separateness from them that in conscious we know being and realize our oneness with it in this relaxed bodily and mental condition if the patient will continually look at being and strive to realize his oneness with it claiming his inheritance then his mind is open to the reception of the divine thought the law of being and these in turn will be registered upon his physical organism promoting healthy vibrations he is but claiming his lost estate he is taking the place of the air in this relaxed condition of which i have spoken he must think i am one with the infinite a ray of light from the eternal source of light a spark of intelligence from the eternal sun thereof i am under the protection of law all power is mine all wisdom is mine the father and myself are one i am living in the kingdom all i have to do is to reach out and take what i want of the abounding life that surrounds me everywhere no wonder then the great healer said be not careful for tomorrow that is full of care be trusting confiding realizing that you are one with him who is too wise to err and too good to be unkind to the humblest of his children remember that it is not the will of the heavenly father that one of these little ones should perish but rather that all should come unto him and have life this new life this abounding life the life which the master said he came that we might have more abundantly if we will at regular times in the day seek these moments of relaxation and communion with the father as sure as day follows night so sure will strength follow and weakness and pleasure follow pain when we go out and walk the streets or ramble a field and look at the azure sky let us remember that this universe is a universe of abounding life and we are a part of it when we look aloft and see the eagle soar in his place we remember we are one with him when we see the fishes in the pool we remember that our life is the same life that is in them when we observe the beauty of the rose and the symmetry of the lily we remember that the father's hand which painted the one and fashioned the other has fashioned this tabernacle of day in which we dwell the same intelligence that placed the principle in each of these has also placed the principle in us that is the kingdom and right thought activity will always keep this harp of a thousand strings in tune in tune with the infinite remember that in these stated times of physical and mental relaxation you are to withdraw from the things of sense withdraw as far from the consciousness as possible and come as near into conscience as you are able remember that when you are in harmony with the infinite the desires of your heart shall be granted that this seeking to be one with the father and hold communion with him is prayer of the highest order the master said but thou when thou prayest enter into thy closet and when thou hast shut the door pray to thy father which is in secret and thy father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly when you remember what was said in the chapter of prayer that is that the soul's sincere desire uttered or unexpressed you will see that this retiring and relaxing and communing is but complying with the master's directions with regard to prayer when we have thus held communion and have felt ourselves to be one with the infinite we are to come out of the closet with that thought settled in our mind realizing that when we come back to the world of consciousness again that the forms of being that disturbed us and the idea of our separateness which misguided us shall no longer have dominion over us but that the permanent desires of our heart shall be oneness with the father so that is the best chapters that i could summarize from the book healing hands by sydney weltner and it's a pretty simple principle the idea is that you can subvert the conscious mind through touch by creating heat with your hands or vibration with your hands it forces a patient to concentrate on the area that you place your hands you also through the idea that you may be telepathically communicating with the person that you're healing try to think their thoughts very much like neville goddard recommends to heal someone else you imagine that you are them and that you are healed it is very difficult for somebody that's sick to heal themselves because depending on what it is it can be very hard the key is that we're just using an enhanced form of affirmation or suggestion we're trying to communicate to the subconscious mind of the patient
we place our hands, we give them a suggestion, and we think with our minds a thought of them being healed. This is sort of an amplified or magnified way of changing the way somebody thinks and activating the unconscious perfect memory in that person. It makes the most sense of me. There's no woo-woo we're talking about. We're not talking about any magical rays, although that may be suggested here. He does suggest that there are some energies moving through our hands, but he is suggesting the key for you as a healer is to understand that you need to be concentrating and focusing specifically on thinking the right thought for your patient. So it's a beginning point. It's a way to understand how healing hands works. If you have ever been healed in a manner like this, where somebody laid hands upon you, please put it in the comments. I want to hear about it. And please let me know what method that they used. Let's share our stories so as many people can read the comments to learn about this, then listen to the video. Please share your stories. If you know of anybody that uses this effectively on a regular basis, let's find out if they're using a similar technique. And if you are, I want to know about it too. So let's learn more about healing hands. I believe this is the beginning, that there is a science to it. Some people may not be as interested in it, but there'll be a point in the future where we will be able to heal anybody. If you can think properly and understand these concepts and your thoughts are powerful, you can be of great service to everyone by thinking thoughts for them, getting close in their vicinity, having them be passive to what you're trying to do, and then influencing the way they're thinking into a way that it changes their health. That's an amazing concept. We have come to this conclusion that our thoughts create reality, but our thoughts create reality for others as well. And this is a way to facilitate that. And the laying on of hands is a way to speak with the unconscious mind because it has a certain way of circumventing some of the conscious thoughts that we have. That's all that's happening here. Now, there is a book that his son wrote that I posted some pictures on in the Facebook group, The Practice of Suggestive Therapeutics by Ernest Weltmer. The reason I recommend this, it has diagrams and is much more specific about where to lay the hands in relation to different things. I believe there's probably a science for this, not necessarily required, but very, very fascinating book. And I've try to see if I could utilize some of the material in there and it's difficult with all of the pictures that are in it. So that is an additional piece of material I recommend. So just let me know. I'd look for your comments, put a like on this video. So if anybody out there needs to learn this, this is a great way of being of great service to others. And we definitely want to learn more. And so also put in the comments, any other authors that you recommend that have used these techniques. I'll definitely be reading about those. I want to learn as much as possible. All episodes of The Reality Revolution can be found at therealityrevolution.com and welcome to The Reality Revolution.